Hello, hello, hello. As I promised, I am going to be talking about the Queen's Gambit today. I know a lot of people have come in previously asking me about it, but today, um, you know, I finally finished watching everything, so I am in the mood to go over not only, like, the story, which I will try to not spoil for anybody here, but I'm also going to be doing actual game analysis of, like, the games they play in the TV show, which is super, super cool. Yeah, so to start off, this is the game between Elizabeth Harmon and Harry Beltic. It's the Queen's, so this is from the, so this is very specifically from the Queen's Gambit. Um, it's a Karakon, and it's a two knights Karakon, but does chess even have rules? Chess actually does have a surprising amount of rules. Spoilers. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, look, if you're coming here today, expect to get spoiled from the chest. I'm try I'm gonna try to not spoil any other thing. Okay? I'm I'm gonna try to not spoil anything else except the chess games, which you can't really see um like that closely anyways when you are watching the TV show, so I don't think it's like a big deal. But um I'm not spoiling, I'm only spoiling the goddamn chess game. That's the only thing I'm spoiling. Oh, thank you so much, Royally Fork for the Prime. Thank you, thank you. Welcome to the pool party. It's a little too late for that. True, I've also spoiled the TV show for you guys before, but... Uh, if two computers play each other in chess, will Wyatt always win? No, it will not. When did this game happen in the show? So this game, the first one we're looking at right now, I'm actually gonna put this up so everybody kind of knows as well what's going on here. Um, also, I'm gonna disable the emote wall for today because this feels like a little bit more serious than what I usually do Like I'm trying to create real content here instead of my regular really fucking scuffed whatever it is I do on a regular basis. So the first game is Beth versus Baltic This game was played um, I think during the Kentucky The Kentucky what's it called state championship the first one if I'm wrong, please correct me. Like, I'm not, I, I'm not like an expert on the TV show. I'm just really in love with Beth. Okay? Like, I can be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. You guys can also correct me. But this should be the first game. Baltic. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, the second episode, right? Okay. So it should be this one. Nemo, have I met any chess players who really remind you of a character in The Queen's Gambit? Um, yeah, yeah, let's just say I have. <laughs> How do I get all of the moves from the show's games? Um, there is a very lovely gentleman. He has a Patreon. His name is Olympio. I will make sure I tweet it out, actually. He is very... So I reached out to Agamator, a god tomato, and he linked me to this man's Patreon, which, um, but yeah, so these games are not sourced by me. They're sourced by somebody else. I'm just trying to see if his, if I can link his Patreon right now. Don't be weird champ about it, chat. Don't be weird champ about it, please. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Um, so there is... So in this post that he posted, I think he linked all of the different games and then you just have to kind of like piece together um, which game is which. So these are the these are scores I very specifically got off of him. All right. No, not is <laughs> God Tomato. God Tomato. That's what I'm calling him right now. <laughs> it's Beltic, not Baltic. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Okay, his name reminded me of the goddamn Baltic countries which I come from. Okay, chat, I'm sorry about that. But without further ado, I'm actually ready. I'm asking you guys to be mature. Yes, I am. Okay, so this is very specifically from the time from this game is the second episode when um, Beth plays in the Kentucky State Championship. All right. Yeah, Peppo G, guys. It's time for some good old Peppo G. I see Sullivan's there, Peppo G. But honestly, before we even dive into all of that stuff, how did you guys, like, find the show? I don't know if, if people watching right now are chess players 
or if you guys are just like people who um you know have a mild interest in chess and just kind of want to like just wanted to show it was fucking amazing okay so what did you guys think very specifically about the chess yeah it's being ranked top 10 on netflix for a month i don't even think it's being out for a month but that's pretty respectful i think it's rank one in canada actually which is obviously where i come from but um heard about it haven't watched it okay i loved it love chess but suck at chess okay fair 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's been out for like a week and a half, for sure. Um, and inspire you to play chess. Then I realize I'm old and it's impossible. You're never too old to learn chess. Honestly, you're never, ever, ever too old to learn chess, okay? If you think you're too old to learn chess, just watch my streams. I'll make it fun for you guys. Don't worry, don't worry. Um, you found out that D4 is called Queen's Gambit. Okay, so actually, the name of the show, The Queen's Gambit, is this is not necessarily The Queen's Gambit. This is only the move D4. If you're going to play something like Knight of Six, this transforms into the hyper modern or Indian openings. But if your opponent plays D5 and C4, this is very specifically the Queen's Gambit. So. <clears throat> Saw her with someone that never played chess and she liked the show. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Honestly, I think the show was so good. A lot of people who didn't even like really you know, play chess, a lot of like my friends and stuff, like they never really, like they always, I was always the token chess player, right? Like in my high school, everybody always knew me as that chess player girl, the girl who plays chess. Like everybody thought it was cool back when I was in high school, but nobody was actually like, yes, I understand how chess works. Um, and basically i had a lot of people reach out to me over the last couple like last couple of days i've, I've been kind of like caught up in my own world recently because of some shit in my life but anyways the point is they were like i never realized that chess could be so intense and i'm like pog this is exactly what i've been trying to tell people for a really long time that chess is not just like you know a game that you kind of sit down with your grandfather and you play and um <laughs> you're never too old to learn chess and how can you explain Calcabur's epsilon rating uh, uh, calc is just special let's just put it that way let's just put it that way um but yeah huh but yeah so i was just gonna say like honestly the show was super good as a competitive chess player as somebody who has gone through a lot of okay obviously the show is fictional there is a lot of you know things about the game that are obviously dramatized like over exaggerated kind of to make it you know seem really really cool but can you see chess pieces on the ceiling depends on what i have during the day but yeah no the the, the chess in the show itself was super accurate it was super super accurate no not magic shrooms that's not what i meant chat <laughs> that's not what i meant okay <laughs> Wait, so you mean drugs and sex is not the normal chess player experience? Actually, a large part of the time, it's it's a it's exaggerated a little bit, but I would definitely say there are definitely a lot of stories surrounding that kind of stuff. I really don't want to go into the specifics. Should you watch the Queen's Gambit? Yes, you should. It's it, this is not even a sponsored stream, but you really should. Um, uh -huh. yeah, no, but there's there's a lot of really good parts about the show. I think it's. I like the gritty part of it. It's obviously a little bit over exaggerated, but but it was really good. The chess was super accurate. It had a very nice description, like de not description, but like it really showed the kind of like the golden ages of chess. Not so much the golden ages, but just like how chess was in the past, right? Because now obviously chess is a lot more, um, f it's a lot faster. It's a lot more kind of like, Mm, I don't know how to describe it, but with the way I'm trying to do things is like I want chess to become more popular and more popularized But back then it was a lot harder for just like the common person to get in chess because you need a large amount of money Right to be able to play in all these over the board tournaments now It's so much easier to play in any kind of tournament because you can first of all play online or you can just go to a local one But back then it was a lot harder. They just didn't have that many tournaments. So I think like it's a very accurate description of like 1960s chess, which is awesome, which is really, really awesome. Um, 
Did it get you fired to, up to play competitive again? I remember Alexandria said that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as somebody who... Like, I don't want to go super in-depth in all this stuff because this is more stuff that I should bring be bringing to my psychiatrist rather than Twitch chat. But as somebody who started playing chess when they were really, really young, so for me, when I was three years old, um, I was always of the opinion that chess was, like, going to be my whole life, right? And I was like, this is going to be, like, everything I do. And it really was everything that I did for a really long time. But obviously... I had moments like Beth in the TV show. Like I had moments like that where you just completely break down or like, you know, all of that stuff really happened. All of that stuff really does happen. Um, obviously not on the same scale as Beth. Beth is a million times more talented than I am. I could never, ever, ever get to that level. Did I steal chess magazines? No, I don't think I've actually ever seen a chess magazine in like a store. I don't think those were a thing when I was um, younger. So... <laughs> But yeah, no, I think the show was pretty accurate in terms of like, I don't know, it just really resonated for me. I know for a lot of people, they were like, there's too much of this, too much of that. I didn't focus enough on the chess, but um, I, well, I would never steal. I've never stolen anything, but yeah. Beth is fictional, so I'm better. Aw, thank you. But I do want to say I relate so much to Beth on so many different levels and I just wish I was as good as Beth in chess, but <laughs> did I troll normal chess players at the mall? I troll, I troll chess, I, I troll people sometimes when I just don't tell them like I play chess and I'm just like, yeah, let's have a game together and then I just beat them, but that's kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> would I recommend reading the book or watching the show? Well, personally, I don't really want, I don't really read books, but I would highly recommend watching the show. The show is super, super fun show is super fun um i think if you like reading i would recommend reading the book but then again i've never read it i don't read that much anymore so if you if you're somebody who wants to read please go ahead i have nothing against it i just have not read but yeah the honestly that show was so good that show was so good read benny's book and getting shape true true do you can do that too <clears> hmm <throat> yeah but like i said um, this opening right here, I have them on the board, is very specifically called the Queen's Gambit. So this first game that we're gonna look at is... Between Beth and Beltic. Oh, so another reason why I really, like, related to Beth was because I won the Finnish National Championships when I was five. So, like, even though Beth is, like, a little bit older than I am, like, throughout the show, like, she's always a little bit older because she started chess older, she did all that stuff older, but, like... Um, I'm 20 years old right now, but yeah, like I've gone through quite a few of those kind of things, I guess, kind of when I was younger, like I had that competitive drive and like I had that, um, where's the gambit? There, okay, so the gambit part of the Queen's Gambit is very specifically this. This is the Queen's Gambit. Um, this is the Queen's Gambit accepted. You can also play the Queen's Gambit decline, which most people go for, but I was like, super into chess when i was younger and then as you got older you get all those problems and all that stuff happens and you know it's just like it's a very very realistic kind of tv show that's dramatized obviously but it has a lot of elements from my own childhood so i'm just like yeah that show hit deep it hit deep and i watched it with a friend too and every single time something would happen in the show he would be like that's you that, that, that's that's actually just me. But yeah, so um, I wish I could be Beth, but sadly, I'm just not good enough at chess as Beth is, but I can live live my dreams, you know? <clears throat> I can live my dreams out. But this is the this is the game, Beth Beltic. Uh, she was really young. This is like one of the earlier games. If you haven't watched the show yet, I don't want to like ruin or spoil anything for you, but you're very welcome to stay and look, look, look at the games. Um, I'm more of a Beltic. I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm not good enough at chess so i don't even know i'm living yes exactly vicariously i'm i'm literally living through <laughs> vicariously i love her um she's actually just amazing so when you were younger do you think you can make a career out of chess i never expected it but here i am now so i'm really happy about it <clears throat> yeah i want to finish youth championships i thought not versus adults but yes once again guys highly recommend the show not sponsored by the way but we're here today to take a look at some of beth's 
fast games. Were you ever escorted around foreign countries by a Finnish secret police agent? Uh, when I was in Iran, there were secret agents following me everywhere. So, yeah. But my career is out of league, that's true too. Mm. I reckon you could have played the best part even better. Yeah, there were not a lot of Chinese players back in the 1960s. I think the first female Chinese Grandmaster was like... Um, 1980s or something. So, did I hit them with the weird gem? No. <laughs> Wait, why are people monkeying? Yeah, Xie Jun. No, not Xie Jun. She wasn't the first one. There was somebody else. <clears throat> Wait, I'm so confused. Oh, secret agent. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In Iran, yeah. Yeah, I was followed around. It's 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 pretty normal actually. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty normal because you're a foreigner. I was there during 2017. Um, it was the 40th anniversary or 40th year celebration of the Spring Revolution. So um, that was the year I played in the Women's World Championships. That was when it was in Iran. Well, they weren't secret if you knew about them, I guess. But like, they were. I could see people following me. It's like it's not like they tried super hard. But I'm literally walking in a park and there's just people around me. So that was my experience of being followed around by secret agents. Maybe not so secret, but I was definitely followed around. <clears throat> but yeah, okay, so back to the game. Because we haven't, you know, really talked about the game yet. D5, nice D3. So this is the Karo Khan. Um, I assume most of you guys already know what the Karo is. I know a lot of people here already know, but for those of you who don't, it's the Karo Khan. This is not the line I play. If you've seen me play chess before, even if you haven't, this is the line I usually play. Um, I usually play the advanced Karo. It's Levy's favorite opening. It's not my favorite opening. It's all pawns and no hope. That's a very good line from the show. Honestly, you guys, all of you guys, all of you chess players are like just so immersed in everything. Um, Okay, I'm just looking for more PGNs of the show. <laughs> Meme that hard in the Discord, yeah, true. Yeah, it's the Karo Khan defense, so... Usually, usually I play the advanced variation, but there's a lot of people out there who play... My typing speed is intimidating, I have very fast uh, words per minute, WPM. But my APM is pretty slow. No, actually I just have bad... I just have bad reflexes, apparently. What key switches do I have? Dude, I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, once again, Karo. H3, bishop takes f3, queen takes f3. This game, so the actual game, like this game itself, was played between, oh my god, I cannot pronounce their names, but it was played in 1955 in Riga, Latvia. So this game actually happened in real life. This is based off of a real game. Obviously in the show, I think this game was played around 1960, so it's pretty accurate. Isn't the exchange variation just equal to black right away, so white should never enter it? Yes, but this is not the exchange variation. The exchange variation of the Karo Khan isn't played like that. It's this one. This is the exchange variation. Are all the games real? Yep, all the games are real. So, uh, for this one, white was Ned's... Medinov and Black was Spartak, Kasparian Spartak. They're both really like well-known players from 1950s, but once again, um, as somebody who hasn't really like seriously analyzed. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Oh my god, wait, whoa, 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 Somebody just sent me 10 games. This is gonna be hype. Oh my god, okay, this is super super cool. Okay, so um, this was back in the Soviet Union days. Uh, Ned's Medinov Rashid versus Kasparian. I don't know if 
you guys know these names or not, but even I don't really. Because you are awesome. Aw, thank you so much, Shiva, for the thousand bits. <laughs> yeah, so I am a true zoomer, but this is an exchange variation for Calcobar. Um, what are the parentheses and line breaks for it? That's just how chess annotation works when you're analyzing it. And I know Agamator has actually covered this before. So, once again, huge shout out to Agamator, God Tomato. Are we doing a game review on Soviet GMs? We're doing a game review on Beth Harmon's games. <laughs> you pronounce Nezhmi Dinov. Alright, well, I didn't realize this became another pronunciation stream. I try really hard to stay away from pronunciation streams, but then I remember chat always likes to correct me. I swear, every single stream I do just becomes another pronunciation stream. So we're gonna try to stay away from that today because there is more interesting content than my goddamn pronunciation. <laughs> Distraction level. <laughs> Thank you so much, Timber to Moon for the Prime. Welcome back to your third month. Distraction level 9,000, we're at. Yeah, that's true. Also, I'm the real Shiba. Oh. Greater than CA. <laughs> I don't know about that one, but I appreciate all the bits, Shiva. Thank you. Um, can't even pronounce pronunciation correctly. Okay, guys, look, 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 look. I know he's very famous. I know all the chess pros in the chat are going to flame me for not knowing who Nezzy is, but I'm going to call this guy Nezzy. Actually, why is Beth? I'm calling her Beth. It's goddamn Beth, okay? It's Beth versus Beltic. I don't care anymore. We've literally been streaming for 30 minutes, and I am six moves in. <laughs> okay, like, I know I have ADHD, but this is not going well. <laughs> this is not going well. All right. <laughs> we're calling her Beth, and we're gonna call her Bone and Beltic. This is going fine. <clears throat> yeah, this is this is this is going fine. <laughs> okay, Bishop G two, Bishop G seven. <laughs> oh my god, the focus part of this is too hard. <laughs> this is too hard. <laughs> All right, but okay, 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 okay. I'm going to try to do my best to kind of like combine the show and like dramatize the game a little bit. Um, but basically what happens is that Beth, as you guys, I don't know if, I don't know how far, once again, all of you guys have watched the show. I don't want to spoil specifics for it, but basically Beth is like an intuitive player. <laughs> I'm gonna finish reviewing this game in two hours. Okay, guys. <laughs> okay, so, once again, Beth is a very intuitive player. She can base she basically has like a natural kind of intuition for the game and this is usually very different from how a lot of the Russian players kind of play. So she was like compared to Morphe, she was compared to like um was it maybe Alehine or something? Oh, Capablanca. She was compared to Capablanca. These players are like very well known for sort of doing their like Remember, this was a time when theory wasn't really a thing, right? But Russian players were sort of more known for being traditional kind of <laughs> spoiled. It's not spoiled. It's not spoiled. <sighs> if I had the knowledge of classic games such as Nez versus Chernikov, you play better than Beth. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna put hashtag spoilers in the title. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, but as you guys know, Beth kind of plays like me. I mean, JK, she plays 10 times better than I do. But basically, I get a lot of um, my inspiration from those kind of players as well, where you kind of don't really necessarily study openings, study all that kind of stuff. But instead, you really work on your tactics and you come up with a lot of intuitive moves. So I am an intuitive player. Um, it is a fictional show, but but Beth is still an absolute fucking inspiration. So she is literally just win. She is literally just win. Okay. All right. So she's done some interesting stuff here, right? She's kind of given up her center. Um, honestly, in modern day chess, this would be something that you don't really do. But then again, it's Beth Harmon, and she's going with the just win strategy. 
So obviously I can't fault her too much for that. But as you guys can see, she's already going for like a pawn side attack despite already being castled there. And yeah, there's there a little bit of spoilers here. You know, I'm just spoiling a little bit of the chess play. It's intuition display with bad memory. That's that's not that's not how it works. No. No. Um, but but she is crazily aggressive. She really likes pushing her pawns up. This is how I play chess when, um, you know, when we've got like a few minutes on the clock. But obviously she has this mindset that if she goes for the attack, right, her opponent won't be able to do much. And she, so, so far, I mean, in this position, she's traded off her pawn from F, from the F file. She's got this really nice, um, half open file here. You play much better if I had all my games borrowed from famous masters. This is very true. If I had as much intuition as you lack the knowledge of the classics, I'd have stopped Magnus by now. Okay, wait, I didn't realize this became a roast the streamer stream. Okay, I'm just here having a good time trying to show you guys some good games of chess, and instead I'm getting roasted by Twitch chat. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, what I reckon the eval bar is here for white. So when the position is usually equal and one of the sides actually has a king, which is kind of out in the open. Um, be stockfish, not clownfish. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> What was the exact name of the pill she took? Asking for a friend. I don't know if I want to say that on stream. Um, but yeah. So anyways, usually in these kind of positions where the material is still equal and your one of your opponent's king, like one of the opponent's kings is still out of the open, usually you can evaluate this position. Uh, what's in that orange juice? Nothing that you should worry about. How do you get stoned from orange juice, buddy? Are you okay? Um... Okay, but anyways, the point is, I'm going to have to like edit this YouTube video so hard. This is gonna be so difficult. You guys are making my YouTube life more difficult. <sighs> okay, but basically when the king is out in the open, you can always say that this is going to be better for white, right? Because the material is equal. If you don't have any compensation for your king being out in the open, this position is just better for white. And so, first of all, his opponent didn't, her opponent didn't actually go for the a4 pawn, which in my opinion might have been better because, okay, well, to be fair, he's losing this pawn, so what he did does make sense. Never mind, I take that back. It's fine. It's fine. The bishop on g2 does suck a little bit, but she's gonna bring it out from here. And this is like an idea that you see a lot in openings like the Sveshnikov, where you play g3, h4, and then put your bishop on h3. At least that's the way I play it. Beth and Beltic get roasted by chat YouTube title. That's true. That's pretty much what's going on. <clears throat> I care about the games and that's honestly all that matters. All right, so as you can see, this bishop comes out from G2. It does this little, what's it called? Maneuver thing. So whenever a lot of players in the middle game, when they get confused about what to play, they just start moving random pawns. But if you're someone like Beth, you would be thinking about how to use all of your pieces in the attack, right? Right, chat? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad that uh, some people here are are paying a little bit of attention. Um, no, we are not using the king to attack down the H file, but the idea is that if you don't use all of your pieces in the play, why do you even have that piece, right? Like if this bishop is just sitting on G2, it's doing absolutely nothing. And a common mistake that I see people do is that in these kind of positions, they just play every other piece except the one piece that hasn't moved yet. Like, if this piece isn't doing anything, you have to consider how to actually use it. Being more aggressive is not necessarily the, the story here, but it's being able to use all of your pieces, right? Um, so, 
she gets a bishop out of g2 so this bishop is now a lot more active than it was on g2 it was defending the h3 pawn but why would you need to defend the h3 pawn when you already have a king on h h2 right so there was no point in that bishop being on g2 and now that the bishop is on g4 it actually does a better job of controlling like this diagonal for example um and as you guys can see here once beth has activated her pieces so she can ha she has the liberty of being able to play something like h4 because her opponent's pieces are all on basically on the back rank and her, her, the queen is not in a very active place so black king is very open for sure and this is something that beltic does well here is i know i'm used i'm referring to the players as the in movie care in movie names but once again for everybody who maybe came in late white is nezzy and black is kasparian i can't pronounce white's name so i'm calling him nezzy <clears throat> yeah write that down chat write that down okay so um, in these kind of positions, you have to start considering where you're going to make progress, right? Where where, where would you make progress? Yeah, she also has to play h4 because the bishop would get stuck otherwise because of f5, even though I don't think that's like a real issue because then e5 pawn would drop, but playing a move like h4 is always really good because you're constantly pressuring your opponent with a move like h5. Like, this is a genuine threat at some point in the game. So, black feels that beforehand and he just moves his king over to g7 so um the h file doesn't open up and, and white isn't able to just uh move her rooks over <clears throat> so basically now white decides to double the rooks onto the f file is white already winning i wouldn't go as far as to say white is already winning that is that is not how it's going but isn't your king just gonna be as exposed as black's king then it's not though because just take a look at what pieces you have around your king it's not always about which pawns you have in front of your king but it's also about uh which pieces right and also the knight on b3 is out of play exactly so white is technically white technically like he doesn't have an extra piece but he has one more piece that's useful so that's why i always say it's really important to keep in mind which of your pieces you're actually utilizing and not just having on the board because if your piece is not like threatening something it's not somewhere where it's making an impact on the position you're basically playing without that piece are the games from the show big brain or pepeka so far all the games from the show are really big brain because they're taken from real games played between real masters um during that time era so even the style of play is super super similar <clears throat> all right so queen c2 okay an, an idea behind the a move like queen c2 is literally just to pressure the knight on b3 right if this knight is under attack this queen can never come really into the gameplay um because then it's just like all right if this queen moves you're gonna lose the knight at some point and now we do see white actually play a move like h5 and this comes back to the question somebody asked before if you play a move like h5 are you not just weakening your king as well well you kind of are but this is a risk that white can take in this position because he has the more active pieces but isn't the white queen stuck pressuring the knight it's not really stuck pressuring the knight because this queen can technically move any time but this queen can't so it's like the pressure doesn't work both ways were you able to follow the moves watching the tv show i feel like it was kind of hard to follow as i paused to see the positions um it was really difficult which is why the games that i got today i didn't just transcribe them from the show they were given to me by a very kind gentleman from patreon um so these are games that i didn't like write down myself somebody else got them for me but yeah <clears throat> c3 is a brilliant move rather than h5 c4 c4 would have been a really interesting move for sure because then the knight gets trapped but i also really like h5 yeah i can add games to the title let's do that thank you thank you for reminding me 
How do I know that he is right? I I trust him pretty much. Um, do lines on evaluation show who's favorite? I have both evaluation and lines turned off now because last time I had evaluation on, um, people trust the engine a little bit too much. And I think as a women grandmaster, my own brain is good enough to explain like why things should be moved, especially in a way that's more intuitive. Because like I said, they played these games during the age of no computers. I miss those days of no computers. Because I think computers really um, mess up our perception of chess a little bit, especially if you rely on it a little too much. So c4 is a really good move here, would be a really good move here, because you can definitely expand on the queen side, but I, once again, I do really like Beth's move um, with h5. It's not that I don't trust the engine, I just don't see the point of using it all that time. Twitch streamer doesn't like computers, Pepo G, Pepo G. <laughs> but yeah, I like h5 because it does open up the king side. This is like that style of play, which is like quite aggressive. <clears throat> I'm 20 years old. So my whole life, it's not that I'm not, it's not, it's got nothing to do with me being better or worse than Aga. It's got nothing to do with that. We all, we both just have personal preferences. For chess and that's okay everyone has a different way of playing chess right um beth has a different way of playing chess from everybody else you know she's super aggressive so that's what i'm saying as engine moves are only the best way if you know the next eight moves pretty much yeah i miss chess before computers and you're only 20. i never got to experience chess before computers that's why i miss it so in these kind of positions, for example, if black takes on h5 and white just takes on h5, sure, you might think that your bishop is also like really, really um, out in the open, but realistically, it's going to be black's king that's a little bit more unsafe. First of all, you can't even play something like that because your knight's going to be here um, under the attack. So what happens is that white gains basically a tempo and can um, transfer the knight, open up the f-file. Actually, maybe take here first so that there is no d takes c3. And you can see that um, even though like, sure, your king is in the open, right? But white's piece is a lot better coordinated to be able to attack uh, black's king. So why, why not g5? Well, if you play a move like g5, you're going to be forever left with a weakness on f6. You will, So you can't get a rook on the h5 and push the pawn. What pawn are you going to be able to push? Your rook on f8 is going to be forever stuck protecting the pawn on f6. Like that rook won't be able to leave unless you're able to get the other rook. But then by that point, you're always using one rook. How do you get the h pawn? What? Oh, talk about white in case black pushes g5? No. So in this position, pushing a pawn like h5 doesn't really do you much good because the king can just go hide. Right? So basically in this position, it's just like you're going to constantly be putting pressure on this f pawn. Um, this is a position where you might actually consider playing a move like c4 and just giving black this really really hellish position because he has no space you can do whatever you want in this position some ideas that i might have in this position for example are um to for example move this knight out of the way maybe reroute it in a way such that i could potentially push my pawn to g4 maybe get my knight to g3 and then go knight f5 so these are some really long-term ideas that i would have in this position but you can kind of see if with every given position that uh, the plans kind of change, right? In this position, you're just suffocating your opponent. In the other position, when you are playing a move like h5 and your opponent goes c5, in this position, you're going for a kingside attack. So chess is really, really dynamic. It switches all the time. So it doesn't mean that if you're in this position, you know, you're doing something like... Um, you could be playing something like h5 and taking on g6. If your opponent doesn't let you do that, well, you can't like be stuck with that idea. You can't be stuck with the idea that, oh, I have to keep attacking on the king's side. I have to be able to push my h pawn down. I have to be able to do all that. That's not really how chess works. I mean, sure, you might be able to make the h pawn down move kind of like this, this idea kind of work if your opponent is, um, you know, 
<clears throat> doesn't play the best moves, I guess. But realistically speaking, if you're familiar with these kind of positions, sometimes when your opponent pushes g5, it's getting the pawn any further doesn't go anywhere because like he can always put a piece right in front of the pawn, in right in front of the promotion square. Is having your king in front of your queen on a file like black d does here always a bad thing or is it okay if the game is quite closed? I would say black's position is definitely very very uncomfortable here. I still don't want to go as far as to say that he's um, lost but this is absolutely useless. It's absolutely useless to have your queen behind your king like this. Like what is the king queen gonna do from g8 right? Is it gonna be doing anything from g8? Is it gonna be able to attack any squares? I mean, does it serve any purpose other than defending the knight on b3? Nope. Just like sometimes how I don't feel like I have a purpose in life, this queen has no purpose in life right now. And, um, maybe get skewered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's just like, you know, you want to find a purpose for yourself. Um, okay, this became a little bit more of a, of a life story, but hey, look, we're talking about a TV show and, you know, there is a lot of things you can learn from chess that you can also apply to real life. But yeah, you weigh up attacking possibilities to analyze who looks better in a position. So in any given position, when you're analyzing it, the first thing you should always be looking at is the number of pieces on the board, right? That's the first thing. Material. Uh, being able to just count which piece, who is up more pieces, who has pieces here, who has pieces there. Um, that's the most important part. Like, that's the first part. And then the second thing, we'll be starting to look at imbalances. Things like king safety things like do i have the pair of bishops is the position closed do i have the knights um the pawn structure um looking at mm, open files looking at which squares you have there are just so many things you can look at to analyze a given position it's really hard to just say like oh yeah silma is preparing his copyright strikes for sure is having no purpose a purpose no yeah, peace activity and weaknesses are probably as a very good summary of it. Like, who has the more active pieces? Where are your pieces able to go? Um, where are the weaknesses in the position? Those are the kind of things you want to look at after material. And there is a very, very good book about this stuff. Um, it's by Jeremy Silman. I don't think Jeremy Silman knows I exist, but shout out to Jeremy Silman. He wrote a book about imbalances and another book about end games, which were like my Bibles when I was a kid for chess. I know I say I haven't read in a long time. So basically like my my time, like the timeline for when I was super serious about chess was from when I was three until I was 15, 16, 16. No, actually 17, because that's when I play World Championship. So from 3 until 17, those were my like golden ages. But I realistically haven't read a book since after I was like 10, maybe. So yeah, the most recent book that I like really remember about is The Alchemist. But when I was younger, before the age 10, I read a lot of books like Jeremy Silman's, um, Imbalances, The End Games uh a lot of those like how to improve your chest kind of things yeah but yeah <clears throat> bet jesus would be a killer chess player for sure 17 is literally three years ago yeah it is but you also have to think about it this way two years in my life is literally 10 percent of my life did i do the math right I think I did do the math right, yeah. Okay, so um, the basically that's all I'm saying, chat. It's just like, man, I am 20 years old, so. <laughs> okay, guys, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Quick math. Yeah, so five years of my life is literally a quarter of my life. I am not being alive for very long. That's not right? Wait, why is that not right? <laughs> So it's 10% of my life, yeah. Two 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 years. It's 10% of my life. Sound a little bit suspicious. 10% <laughs> plus taxes. True. Um 
I've been out of high school longer than you've been alive. Wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm so like I said, my life is three years is more than 10%. Yeah, that's why I said two years. So three years is more than 10%. I can't do three out of three divided by 20. I just can't. Um, I'm not that old. Yes, exactly. But that's all I'm saying. When I say like a long time ago, for me, it really feels like a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> like for me, it genuinely feels like a long time ago. Because I have not been alive for very long. I understand two years, three years might not seem like a very long time. But for me, three years ago is literally like a lifetime ago. So yeah. But basically, um, yeah, we know what you mean. All right, awesome. But yeah, so like I said, let's go back to the game. His opponent played, so Belt, her opponent played C5 actually. Beltic played C5. Nemo at 10 could beat me at chess, Sag. I could probably beat you at chess when I was five, but we don't talk about that part. <laughs> Pago. Pago. <laughs> AKA Flexco. <laughs> oh man, the Campbell D. Colin. <laughs> we don't like you anymore, Satch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit of a flex. <laughs> Chat rose room. Oh my god, I feel so bad. I actually feel so bad. I'm sorry. The guy hasn't typed since then. The guy is alive. <laughs> he, he, he's alive. <laughs> he typed, he typed, he typed. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. <laughs> I put this on as background noise. Oh, your insults. <laughs> True. All right. Well, um, I am very sorry about that. I didn't mean for it to come out. <clears throat> I did not mean to. I did not mean to. <sighs> Flies. What was my rating at five? I was thirteen hundred at five. Um, I was two thousand by ten, and I was two thousand. I peaked when I was sixteen at two thousand three hundred sixty-seven. I got my women grandmaster title in fifteen at fifteen. You're 20, 1268. Okay, so I was actually better than Morphe versus Fisher um, when I was five. <laughs> this is still game one. Yes, it is. Yeah. But like I said, it literally went. No, I was at five years old. I was on top of the world. <laughs> and then it just went downhill from there. But yeah, so um, I was I was a lot better at chess when I was younger. Were you ever as low as 500? No. Um, the first tournament I played in, I came third. <laughs> Joking about the two hour thing. I think we might hit the two hour thing, Kakabra. I think we might be spending three hours on this one game. <laughs> I peaked 15 years ago, for sure. <clears throat> You're 31, 960? Yeah, not bad, not bad. Is it only downhill from now? I hope not. I wanna. I think that, you know. It's not about whether or not it goes down. I think it's about it transforming. Right now, I'm onto different kind of things as like, I wanna make chess into more of an esport and make it more accessible uh, with everybody, especially with COG and like working with a really nice org. So my kind of like goals have just changed in the game um, and not so much, you know, <clears throat> whether or not chess is going up or down for me. Which one is Elizabeth? Elizabeth is white. And I do have 5D chess. I played it on stream. You can find it on my YouTube. But yeah. <clears throat> so basically, once again, 
when you get in these kind of positions, so Black just doesn't want to take this pawn. First of all, he doesn't really need to because that pawn's always going to be here, but also White is just pressuring the center, right? So whenever your opponent's king is unsafe, you kind of want to open the center. I know this position is a little bit weird, and this is like one of the things that um, back in the old days, they didn't have like perfect theory or anything like that. So from a player to a revolutionary, I wish. That's a nice way of saying hard stuck. I'm not hard stuck. I just, I genuinely just think that there's more I can do to the game than keep grinding chess. I genuinely think that I can bring a lot more um, to the world of chess other than, you know, being another woman grandmaster. Because there are enough women grandmasters better than I am. I, I've already done like my pro phase. I've done the competitive phase. Um, so I'm just like, you know, it would be cool to get more people into it. It'd be cool to get more girls into it. Retired at 16, Omega lol. I retired at 17. <laughs> Did nobody actually clip that insult? Someone has to go back and clip that insult. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so basically like, this, these kind of games are a little bit different from the games we would see these days. Well, not even necessarily, honestly. It's like chess has all these phases, but uh, the way that White plays, so Beth plays, um, or the actual Nezi plays, is very interesting because he knows that his opponent's king in the center. A lot of people will always say, my pro career is longer than Paul Morphy. I like that slicer. I do like that. <laughs> <clears throat> But yeah, one of the best things about chess, I think, is that even if, like, I take a break from competitive, I can go back to it later. So I think that's one of the things that don't really force me to stay in chess, unlike a lot of other video games where you have to play when you're younger. For me, I can always go back to chess when I'm done, you know, everything else I want to do. I can always go play tournaments again later. Is the show friendly for chess rookies? Absolutely. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, but once again, coming back to this game, right? Like, the king, white's king, everybody might say it's a little bit unsafe, but realistically, kings are only unsafe if your opponent can attack them. Right? Like, your king could be in the middle of the board, and there could be nothing attacking it. I do that all the time. And fail miserably sometimes, but... You can keep your king wherever, if, as long as your opponent can attack it. Yeah, black doesn't have anything to do here. That's why opening up the center is so good in this position, because it's actually black's king that's going to get attacked. So, uh, just tell them to not attack my king. True, true, true. Just just be like, yo, buddy, can we like sign an agreement here? Not allowed to attack my king. Um, but once again, yeah, the only real attack here, the only like checks or like threats that black really has in this position would be to use the queen. But who cares about that? It's one check. Is it considered to say if the opponent can attack it in two moves? So... It can look really scary, but then you also have to remember, like, what you're able to do yourself, right? Okay, so actually I made an incorrect move here. Here is a lot better because you just protect this g3 pawn. Um, if you're take, and then you can just take on f6 and your king is just protecting this pawn. Hmm. <clears throat> I can wish you just alley up. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this position, like, black is just totally lost. You can play g7, you can take the knight. There's just so many things in this position that are totally winning for white. Honestly, I really like g7, because you can take the rook, and then you can take the knight on e7, then you're going to be up a whole rook. But like I said, what's the time control for this game? I would assume, like, in the TV show, um, so this is 1955. Usually, you have game in two hours with a choice of adjournment after five hours or something. Not five hours, that doesn't make sense, like... I don't even know how it worked, but you could adjourn at some point. Sorry, my math didn't add, add up there. But these were like four hour games or something. And you could also play them the next day. I used to sit at boards for, for five hours. If a five year old could sit at a chessboard for five hours, you can too, chat. 2.5 hours of 40 moves in the 1950s. There we go. So that explains the five hour thing, which I was thinking about. So um, after 40 moves, I think you have the choice of a Jordan. And then you can continue it um, the next day. So that was accurate in the show, actually. 
<laughs> yeah, but the 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 games were really, really, really um, long. It's it's like those things don't happen anymore in modern chess, but like it used to happen. But back in uh, so currently in chess tournaments, like the big ones, the really important ones, um, is usually ninety minutes plus 30 seconds per move for the first 40 moves and then after move 40 you get an additional 30 minutes Hikaru said he's only had ever had one adjournment I've never had an adjournment that's like a timeline that's passed yeah I would never be able to get back I kind of miss that though like imagine imagine if I could have adjourned games that would be so much fun <laughs> You had two adjournments your very first tournament. Wow. Yeah, I was born in the time of no more adjournments, so that's sad. Hey, Benny. Yeah, they don't do adjournments anymore, but not just because of that. They took away adjournments um, even, I think, before that. Yeah, they would just check the engine night, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair. But all I'm saying is, if I was born in the 1950s, <laughs> Beth Harmon literally has stealing stockfish. Okay, relax. All right, so this is the part where you kind of see like how good Beth was at tactics. So this is a really interesting move, actually. Like it's a bit like a discovered attack. You'd be seventies or born in the fifties. Yes, good, good math there. You were born in time. Calling you old? I'm not calling anybody in chat old. All I'm saying is, a lot of people in chat play chess at a different era from me. Um, but yeah, once again, good tactics, really interesting tactics. It's not like it, you know, it serves its purpose for sure. Because once the rook takes, you can play queen takes. And if queen takes the bishop, then you have um, queen f8. Because then if king takes g6, you have rook to f6. Is this a spoiler free stream? I'm The only thing I'm spoiling here today are the chess games. So if you like don't want to know anything about the chess games, yeah, there will be slight spoilers, but it's literally just about chess. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, so the tactics is really good. And once again, the idea of the a move like bishop e6 is just that you have the two rooks on the open file, right? You want to open that file up. So she was just able to use a move like bishop e6 to really, really force her opponent to move the rook away. And once the bishop is treated, the rook can't exactly go back to f8 because you still have the two rooks on the open file, right? So basically, these rooks are going to just come running down black's king, literally. So rook f7, check, king h6, queen takes g6. Okay, this is really beautiful. This is really, really beautiful, chat. I didn't watch the TV show yet. I'll sell by anything that looks like a spoiler. There we go, John. There we go. Um, all right. And basically, beautiful tactic. The king is forced to run, and you'll be able to deliver mate with bishop to f5. It's a really, really pretty ending. Like, it's such a pretty ending. Um, like, look at that. The whole queen takes knight thing. So the way that a lot of people need to like kind of spot these tactics is first of all, chess.com has a really good puzzle system that you guys can, you know, check out. So if you haven't signed up for chess.com yet, make sure you're signing that, signing up for that. But also whenever your king, when your opponent's king gets into like the corner of a board, um, what you can do is start looking for mating nets, right? You gotta look out, look out for mating nets. Um, and mating nets are literally just looking for ways that you've seen people get checkmated before. So a really common one would be the ladder mate with the rock. You've probably done this before in like a pure end game where your opponent had no more pieces, but you can also think about how to use these different kind of mating nets in positions that are uh, not necessarily just the... <clears throat> um, just just the end game you can also use them in different positions which is really cool all right we spent one hour analyzing that game can we get 
a people clap in the chat. <clears throat> that took a little bit longer than I expected. Just a little. <laughs> 